Hi, everybody. My name is Robert Carter. I'm a speaker for Creation Ministries International out of our U.S. offices right here in Powder Springs, Georgia. We've come out to this nature area because that is the topic of today's talk. Earth. This is Earth, folks. What is this? How is it made? What is, what is the nature of reality? Those are the things we're going to get into as we discuss why some people believe that the Earth is flat. I recently gave a talk on the subject at our Creation Super Conference. We like that so much we wanted to share it with you. There's about 600 people there. But before we get into it, I want to explain to you what the audience was seeing when they came into the room. Flat Earthers will say that NASA has no picture of the Earth from outer space. That is completely untrue. We, ha we humans, we have sent a satellite into outer space and we got it between the sun and the earth at a place called a Lagrange point. It's a point where the gravity from the sun and the earth are balanced. And so just with a little bit of finagling of little teeny rocket engines, you can keep a satellite right in one place. And it has a camera and that camera is pointing directly at the earth. The camera is between the earth and the sun. And every hour it takes a high def image of the earth and sends it back to us. You can see clouds moving, you can see the earth turning, and the coolest thing about the video is that the moon photobombed the Discover satellite. So you might be wondering, why does CMI care about the flat earth or not? Well, this is a really big deal. This is a really important topic. It's influencing a lot of people. It influences the way we think about the nature of reality, about the nature of God, about how we do science. And since we are a science organization, we like to talk about science. This is a really fascinating idea. It has captured a lot of people's attention. In fact, it has trapped a lot of people in a specific way of thinking that is wrong. So what I hope to do is unpack this a little bit and share with you a couple of really key ideas that you can use to know that the earth actually is round, to explain why people are saying it, where they're coming from, and just I'm going to fill it up with a lot of really interesting tidbits about astronomy, gravity, and science. We hope you enjoy it. How do we know what we know? How do you know? Well, obviously you have to use your brain, right? You have to think. But sometimes learning stuff feels like you're drinking from a fire hose. And in the modern digital world, there's a fire hose of misinformation. Everybody has an opinion about everything. How do you know which is right? That's a tough question, isn't it? Sometimes people speak very confidently, but they're talking nonsense. I would put Richard Dawkins in that camp. <laughs> but also within our community, we see this happening also. I mean, in a Christian community. And specifically, people who are Christians and flat earthers. There is a... Um, a problem that we all have, and that is we're not an expert in everything. And when someone speaks authoritatively, blah, 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 I know this stuff, you should, you're just a peon, what do you know? Um, we don't often have enough knowledge to refute what that person's saying. And that makes life difficult. Politics, religion, science, that, that's really hard stuff. Hopefully you're learning stuff at this conference, is why we're here, to help you answer questions and things like that. But here's one of the most pernicious problems we have. Humans, by nature, self-segregate. We normally hang around with people that listen to the same music, maybe grew up at the same time, eat the same foods, have the same sort of a cultural thing. It's uncomfortable to be around people who are really different than you, for most people. Just part of human nature. But the problem is, in the modern world, we are separated algorithmically. Because Google and Facebook and YouTube aren't going to feed you information you don't like because then you'll leave their website. So we are pigeonholed, categorized, and fed a bunch of stuff that drives advertising dollars to them. It is not surprising then that the flat earth idea was essentially non-existent before the rise of YouTube. I'm going to give you two big ideas. The first big idea I'm going to give you, and we're going to use this throughout to test different things. It's called the two-world fallacy. This is what I call it. Um, imagine two worlds. And I developed this uh, to explain evolution. Imagine there's a world of evolution and the world of creation. Is it fair to say 
like an evolutionist would, every bit of information I find that supports evolution disproves creation. Is that fair? Is it fair for me to say everything I find that supports creation disproves evolution? No, because of this. Joel hinted at this in his last talk when he talked about natural selection. Natural selection is in both sides. I have no problem with natural selection whatsoever. It's just mathematical. It's kind of common sense. And natural selection is not evolution. You see, there is a zone of overlap between any two competing ideas. I call this non-discriminating information. It is information you cannot use to make a decision between the two theories. If you want to know which one is right, you have to ask the right question. The question has to be a question that's either right or wrong in one side or the other. Um, flat Earth ideas have no supporting evidence whatsoever. Literally zero. Geocentrism is harder to refute because it's almost intuitive. It looks like things are going around the earth. It's almost biblical, because the, Bib the Bible uses language that's kind of equivocal, and you, know, you can read it as if everything goes around the earth. But in the same way, if you listen to my speech throughout the day, you could accuse me of being a geocentrist. I talk about sunrise and sunset. I'm, I got my Google phone. You realize this is a geocentric reference idea, right? It's telling me how to drive on the earth as if the earth's not moving. It's not telling me, make sure you match the rotational orbit, uh, rotational speed of the Earth and the, or the motion of the solar system through the heavens or else you're going to fall off. You know, th that's not part of our model. <laughs> we use this geocentric thing as a shortcut all the time. Okay. As I raise up some points, I'm going to go cart back to this. Remember the two-circle idea. Where does this fall on the spectrum? And I'm going to try to bring up a couple of very easy things that absolutely destroy the flat Earth concept and a couple that absolutely destroy the idea that things go around the Earth. It's going to take me a while to get there, but just follow me. Okay, we're okay with this so far? Here's another idea for you. Defining the word science is difficult. What if science to use a definition I might try, attempt to try. What if science is just an interpretive filter of reality? It's a way of thinking, a way of taking information, categorizing it to try to make sense of it. Imagine that reality is these vertical red lines. Imagine that your concept of science is the diagonal lines. Can you see that even if you're kind of wonky in your understanding, you might get some things right? That's evolution. Evolution absolutely gets some things right. And that's all the evolutionists like to talk about, and it's all in the area of overlap between the two theories. I can listen to an evolutionist talk for a long time before I find something I disagree with them about. There's an awful lot of things they say. I'm like, yep, 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 sure enough, true, uh-huh. Happens all the time. But it doesn't mean their entire theory is right. Starting from that idea of naturalism, they ran a long way before they ran into modern technology, which refutes naturalistic uh, ideas of origins, uh, the origin of information, the origin of life, the origin of complexity, the origin of the human mind. Evolutionary theory can't handle that. Now, I'm not claiming I have a perfect filter. I would not do that. That would be hubris. I'm not going there. I'm not claiming that I understand everything correctly. But can you see that the closer you get your filter to reality, the more you'll be able to explain? This is science. This is how science progresses. A scientific theory or idea or hypothesis that has a very high explanatory power is usually assumed to be correct. Okay? The reason why modern science has rejected geocentrism is because after centuries of work, it fell apart. The reason why science has never supported flat earth is because there's nothing to support it. Now, I might be making some of you angry. Forgive me. I don't like calling people out. I'm going to have to, in a couple of slides from now, I'm going to say something maybe a little more harsh than I normally do. Um, but it's for a reason. You'll see. There's a risk that any teacher runs. This verse troubles me greatly. Sometimes keeps me awake at night. James 3.1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. There is a danger to being a troll, a danger of judgment. I am actually doing this with a tremendous amount of trepidation. I've been worried about this talk for a long time. Not that I don't know my stuff, not that I haven't studied a lot, but 
if I'm claiming other people are trolls, I had better make sure that I'm being really careful with my words and really accurately saying this is what the person teaches and believes. I do not see any accuracy coming at me from the flat earth community. Completely misunderstanding, deliberately maligning my words and, and twisting things around, but I'm trying to be fair to the other side, okay? There is some homework that anyone has to do before they engage in this topic. Uh, I've spent too much time on this, more than I should have. Uh, Jonathan Sarfati and I have done several very important and very long articles, very detailed with lots and lots and lots of information. I cannot possibly uh, regurgitate all this. It's there for you. In fact, I'm going to skip over some really important parts of this idea because of some of the things I want to talk about, but it's all in these articles. Why the universe does not revolve around the earth. That was our first one we wrote together. It was like 32 pages on Word, and then we added more to it later. Second one, refuting absolute geocentrism. We waited till we got responses back and then we address those specifically. Another one, and this, this is surprising because all of a sudden, it was like two or three summers ago, don't remember exactly, we had a whole bunch of CMI speakers all at the same time say, you know, I just ran into a flat earther. We had never heard of this. I mean, we kind of heard about it because we know that the, the secularists manufactured this flat earth myth that never existed. Columbus, the people in Columbus's day, nobody believed the earth was flat. It's an, it's a, 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 an urban myth invented to try to discredit Christianity. Go to creation.com, you can look that up for yourself. I don't have time to deal with it here. But all these flat earthers started popping up and people were like, yeah, this person asked me at a church and they're like challenging me, what on earth is this? And so when enough of that happened, we realized something, there was a trend going on. So we wrote an article called A Flat Earth and Other Nonsense. And then I wrote an, an article that I actually used my children to help with an experiment, a direct test of the flat earth. Now, another article I want to highly suggest is called How to Think, Not What to Think. That two-circle illustration I just showed you, that was first presented in that article. I think that's a very powerful test of any, any idea. Does it really cut the mustard? Does it really split the difference? Is it a valid question? Those are hard to come up with. By the, you know, there's, there's three types of scientific experiments. Type 1, type 2, type 3. Sometimes people say type A, B, C, but type 1 is an experiment where it actually separates two theories. Yes and no for both. Those are hard to find. The second type of experiment is, yeah, it disproves this theory, but it really doesn't say anything about this other theory. That would be the Michelson-Morley experiment, where they point an interferometer in all directions and they notice that the light speed didn't change. What does that mean? Either the Earth isn't moving, or the light speed's the same in all directions. It, it disproved the ether, but it didn't prove the Earth was moving. The third type of experiment and sadly, as a scientist, I'm, I will admit to you, I have done some of these before, is a faulty experiment where the conclusions have nothing to do with what you're testing. Scientists do this, whoops, wow, that was absolutely ridiculous. Why did I even think that? Because science is a process and you learn as you go. Okay, so I'm admitting that I'm not perfect here, but those three types of experiments, we're gonna try to find type one. We're gonna end up with a lot of type two. Almost all the flat earth, objections to the idea that Earth is round or type 3. And yet in the age of information, I call this Carter's theorem of information contamination. As a young man in this room, I, I didn't ask permission to mention his name, but Jonathan, thank you. May you have a promising career in mathematics. He helped me formulate that formula. Basically, it's this idea is that for every true postulate that exists, there will eventually be at least one YouTube video claiming it is not true. <laughs> In mathematical terminology, as the limit, as time approaches infinity, of the probability of the false claim equals one. For every false claim, you will be able to find someone who claims to believe it. The problem is you cannot separate the true believers from the trolls. It is not possible online to know if that person really believes what they're saying or not. And that's one of the hardest things about this whole thing. I know that there are trollish flat earthers out there who just yank in people's chains. And there are some people who believe it. I don't know what the ratio is, but everywhere I go, in fact, I was at a 
homeschool conference in Texas a couple weeks ago, and three lovely women, nice, nice homeschool moms, very normal, you know, middle class, you know, husbands are professional. So they come up to me and they're like, <laughs> yeah, NASA, as if NASA is a swear word. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, this, oh, you know what they do over at CERN. Yeah, you mean the big atoms? Oh, yeah, CERN. As if CERN was like a swear word, like it's part of this gigantic government conspiracy. And sure enough, we got into it and it didn't take very long. They didn't say the earth was flat. They said, I, I, I don't know what the shape of the earth is. I've not experienced it. No, oh, wait, that's a, that's a psychological, that's a philosophy here that we're going to get into. And another problem is that someone can float an idea in 30 seconds that might take you three days to figure out. I'm game. Here's two memes. Now, I don't know who made these. I just stole these off the internet. I might have done some copyright infringement. It doesn't say copyright there, so I just took them. All right. Pilots black out at nine Gs. The Earth spins at 1,000 miles an hour. You know that's true, right? 24,000 mile circumference thereabouts, 24 hours, that's about 1,000 miles an hour. Well, if pilots black out at nine Gs, how come we don't black out at the equator? Come on, what's the answer? Yeah, they're mixing apples and oranges here. Pilots can fly at multiple times the speed of sound and not black out, but at a much slower speed, velocity, if they do a hard turn, they might black out because it's the acceleration, not the velocity. Ah, boom. How about this one? Child on a merry-go-round, fearing for his life at a very slow speed, but the Earth spins at 1,000 miles an hour. How come we don't fly off? How come wind doesn't rip the Earth apart? How come, how come, how come? What's the answer? Well, how fast would the merry-go-round have to spin to produce the same amount of centripetal acceleration as a spinning Earth? Actually, it's uh, 59.1 seconds. So yeah, I'm a nerd. I like math. I like challenges. This, see, these sort of things are sort of things that like, like nerdy scientists, engineers, and physics majors throw at each other in the break room, and they all laugh. Ha ha, yeah, the kid will fly out. Why don't we fly off the earth? Ha ha ha. But then some people actually do it seriously. So the solution, there's a formula right there. I worked through it. Um, it turns out that if you weigh 100 kilograms, that's 220 pounds, you would weigh 12 ounces less on the equator than you do at the North Pole. whoop de doo <laughs> This is true, by the way. We can measure this. We know that there, you actually weigh less at the equator. There's two reasons, actually. One, because the Earth spins, the Earth is flattened a little bit. It's not a sphere. It's an oblate spheroid. And the equator is farther away from the center of mass than the poles are. You weigh more at the poles because you're closer. But when you factor in the shape of the Earth, it doesn't account for all the weight change because you are moving, but it's only a fraction of what you weigh. How fast would the Earth have to spin to, or how fast would the merry-go-round have to spin? Well, if it's a three meter merry-go-round, that's just an easy number mathematically. It's kind of big for a merry-go-round, uh, but literally, it would have to turn once every 59.1 seconds. That would be the most boring playground ride in existence. In fact, you would have to stare at it to see if it was turning. You ever stare at a second hand to see how fast it goes? It is moving. Oh, wait. Yeah, it is moving. Yeah, yeah. But it's not because you can see it move usually. It's usually because now it's in a different place. It was just a little bit ago. And the relative movement you can notice much easier than looking at it. <laughs> this idea that we would fly away is a lie. Most people who are promoting flat earth ideas don't know that. But the person who put this together probably did. A lot of this information is coming out of skeptical websites, just for fun. They'll float something out there and see how far it gets. Man, can I get this idea to go viral? Will the flat earthers pick it up? Will the Christian flat earthers pick it up? Yes, That's what, that is definitely happening. But I'm here to tell you that there is a better way. There is a place where we can have the Bible and science. It's a happy place. You have the Bible, history, science, all wrapped up into a nice, neat bundle. It's not driven by fear. It's not driven by conspiracy theory. It's not driven by distrust and authority. It's actually driven by trust. Trust in the Creator, who created a world that we can understand. We can know that some things are true. 
we can safely assume that some other things are true, but we have to learn where to draw that line, and that's often difficult, hence the creation evolution issue. But there are some things we really don't have to struggle with. Here's my basic assumption. The universe behaves in a consistent, logical, and discoverable way because of the nature of God. He is consistent. He is logical. He is the one in whom there is no shadow of turning. He cannot and will not do anything against his own nature. Thus, when he created the universe, he would have done so according to his basic character traits. The universe is discoverable and knowable because God. <clears throat> that thought is what drove the scientific revolution. The mo modern science was founded by that kind of a philosophical idea. It's actually coming straight out of Christian philosophy. So men like Johann Kepler, amazing, amazing uh, uh, astronomer, he discovered the three laws of planetary motion that drive hall anytime we want to send something into outer space. We have to account for these. And he says of his work, it was like thinking God's thoughts after him. But it wasn't just Kepler. Almost all of the founders of modern science were Bible believers. Now some we might debate a little bit about what they actually believe about it. But no, they, by and large, held a biblical worldview. You ever struggle in science class? Remember those horrible formulas? Ugh. Remember all those letters in the formulas? Most of the letters are the initials of a Christian's name. Oh, that's a cool thought. Yet I had a, um, a flat earther on Facebook. I spent a lot of time on Facebook discussing these things. Um, this person said, I believe the father of lies could have reverse engineered his model so all the math works. Is that true? Can Satan build something so sophisticated it would actually explain the way things work? Or how about this? Who gave us the ability to think, God or Satan? God did. Who put in us a desire to explore the world, God or Satan? God did. It's part of the dominion mandate. Go look that up on creation.com. Who created this world? Oh. Can Satan deceive people into thinking a completely untrue thing about an obvious reality? Yeah, which is why the Hindus teach the earth is flat. Oh, it's Eastern philosophy, it's not Christianity. For 2,000 years, no, no Christian scholar that I'm, I'm aware of, and I've looked, and Dr. Sarfati's looked at even much more than I have, no Christian scholar of any repute, maybe with two little minor examples, have taught that the earth is flat. It is unanimous in Christian tradition, the earth is a globe. Can Satan deceive millions of people about simple math? No. Obvious realities are obvious realities. One plus one equals two. Well, except for really high values of one. I'm sorry, nerd joke. The flat earth idea is driven by Zytidic astronomy. It's this idea. I perceive something to be true, therefore it must be true. That's close to being real. That's close, but it's not right. Because what if you and I perceive something different? Let me introduce you to what I call the idiocentric model. Now, idio, idio is the Greek word for pertaining to self. It's not idiot, it's not stupid model. It's the pertaining to self model, ready? The universe, I know what the universe revolves around. That spot right there, and you can't prove me wrong. Watch, I can make the universe spin. Did you feel it? I feel, it makes me dizzy thinking how fast the universe spins around me. I get in a car, I push down the accelerator, I can feel the gravity tendrils holding me back, resisting me, accelerating the whole universe behind me. Prove me wrong. Do I have a volunteer that can prove me wrong? Someone raise their hands. Anyone. I won't embarrass you too bad. Yes, sir, stand up. Ready? You're not going to turn around at the same time. I'm going to spin the universe. You're not. Ready? Go. The universe spun. Okay. <laughs> Sir, did I spin the universe? No, I did. No, I did. No, I did. Hey, I have more mass. <laughs> what do we do 
when two different ideas are sitting there and they conflict? How do we rationalize this? Is one right and one is wrong? Not in this case, we're both wrong. But I don't know that. I think the universe spins around me. That's scientific astronomy. We are too small to be able to measure single-handedly the size of the Earth. You either have to take two measurements at two different times or two different measurements at two different places. That might help if you have another person that you trust to go someplace else to take a measurement with you. The question is too big for a five and a half to six foot tall human. We need something more. We need to be able to add information from various observers together. This is why it took them centuries to figure out that the sun does not go around the earth. It was not easy. Here's a basic flat earth model. Um, they, they believe in, in different things. This is not the old sun goes underneath the earth and gets hauled and pops up again. That, that, no, no, no. Because everybody knows that the sun has to rotate above the earth like this. They say it's about 3,000 miles up. Now, I can apply math to that. Oh, yeah. And they say it's about 25,000 miles in diameter. Notice we're talking about miles. Ugh, miles. We're scientists. We're talking kilometers. But, okay, miles. We'll go, go with miles here. 3,000 miles up, 25,000 miles in diameter. I don't care what the numbers are. Give me any numbers you like. I will apply a little bit of trigonometry, and I will tell you where the sun is supposed to be at any time of day. And I know the sun never sets. Because at sunrise, the sun should be 19 degrees above the horizon. And at midnight, it should be about, oh, about that far above the horizon. And it's close enough for me to see. Ah, but the solution to this is the sun is not a round ball. It's a spotlight. So you can't see it from the side. Man, it's funny that, you know, someone handed me this flat earth model. And for the life of me, I can't figure out how to put it together. <laughs> Throw away joke. <laughs> So one has to explain then how the sun that's round, even if it's a spotlight, can do that. On the equinoxes, exactly one half of the earth is lit up and that, that slice rotates around. Or this, at the June solstice, the entirety of the North Pole, if anything within the Arctic Circle, is lit up for 24 hours. The entirety of anything south of the Antarctic Circle, which is most of Antarctica, um, is uh, Antarctic Circle, which is most of Antarctica, is in darkness for 24 hours. And then six months later, it would look like this, where all of Antarctica is lit up and anything within the Arctic Circle is dark. How does a spotlight sun do that? Mendacious, straight lie. Very popular uh, flat earth YouTuber. They have a model of the flat earth and they take a, a half, a, a glass dome, a half a sphere, put it on top of the earth and shine a flashlight onto it and it makes all sorts of weird patterns. Look at that, see that? The sun can make these, these shapes. Why is that wrong? No, because in the flat earth idea, their sun is inside the glass dome, not outside. <laughs> Eratosthenes, one of my scientific heroes. This is, um, he died in 194 BC. He was the, li the head librarian at the Library of Alexandria. He calculated the circumference of the earth very accurately. All right, 200 BC, right? We already knew how big the earth was. What he did was he knew that there was a well up in Aswan, also called Syene, where um, the sun hit the bottom of the well. We debate if it had actually happened, but you know, he said there's this well there. And because he was a head librarian and they did very detailed surveys of Egypt every year and he had those records, he pretty much knew exactly how far it was from Alexandria to Aswan. And, and he said, well, if that day the sun is straight up, he had a shadow and he measured on that same day and said, oh, it's about seven degrees. That means I'm about seven three hundred sixtieths of the way around the Earth from this place. Oh, no, and just got to multiply the distance times that ratio, and he calculated the circumference of the Earth. That's cool. 
Now, where does the flat earth idea of 3,000 miles come from? I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe what, what they're doing is they're taking Eratosthenes' numbers and flattening the earth out. So about 800 kilometers and about 83 degrees, you can use the calculations to figure out that H in this case would be about 3,000 miles or 5,000 kilometers. Let's use kilometers as science. The problem with this for us here is that we're about the same latitude as Alexandria, Egypt. People don't realize it, but if you go from Atlanta or here in Myrtle Beach and you go east, you don't hit Europe, you hit Africa. And this is within maybe a degree or two, maybe two degrees, maybe a little more than two degrees of Alexandria, right here. So these numbers apply to us and much of the continental United States. If we fix this at 3,000 miles, we're going to get any set of sticks going across the earth, you're going to get these angles. The problem is that angle will change based on the height of the sun, right? And you can measure it at different places, and you know what? You get different answers at different places. We know what, angles, what angle it is. In fact, the angle is exactly equal to the latitude on a sphere. This is not debatable. This is something anyone can do in their backyard. We've known this for centuries. This is science, and it's just like one of those so plain facts that is not even worth talking about. But I'm a nerd. So I, I, I did this. I calculated the sun angle for various latitudes, or in this case, distance from the equator, because there's no really latitude in the flat Earth concept. And, and the angle, so it, it depends upon how far away the sun is. So this is between 1,000 miles up and a million miles up. The angle changes, right? But then I said, yeah, but the angle actually equals the latitude. So on the top on this one, I have distance, and the bottom I have latitude because they're compared, they're exactly parallel to one another, and you get this nice straight line. Well, if you take their 3,000 mile figure and our measurements of the angle, you know what, they will be right at some point north of the Arctic Circle. You can set this angle to be correct at some point on the planet, but you'll be wrong at every other latitude. Direct test and a failure of the flat earth concept. I'm trying not to say flat earth model. It's not a model. That's not fair to use that word. Now, there was a point today in southeast Cuba, I believe it was 1.32 p.m., where the sun was exactly overhead one farmer's field, straight up. The sun actually followed a line across the earth. It's called the tropic. You've heard of the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn? Those are the places with the farthest north and south on the earth where the sun goes straight overhead. But there's a daily tropic, and today's tropic went right across Cuba. Well, using a little bit of math and their flat earth model, there's Myrtle Beach on there, there's the tropic of today, there's the equator, there's the North Pole. Look at all these distances, and they say 3,000 miles. I can calculate where the, earth was, where the sun was supposed to be at solar noon. In fact, Using a little bit of math, very simple. I mean, this is easy math. Any time during the day. I made an Excel spreadsheet where you can type in what your latitude is and what the tropic of the day is. I can tell you where the, the, earth, where the sun is supposed to be in the flat earth concept and in the global earth reality. In red is, oh, let, me, let me explain my, my machine that's been sitting over here. Um, we were going to do this tomorrow. It's going to rain tomorrow. I'll have this out probably Thursday. It's going to be cloudy, but it might be enough sun. This is an amazing machine. I didn't know if it was going to work or not when I built it. If you line this up, pointing due north, there's a hole right here, and underneath there, there's an there's a angle measurement. So 0, 20, 30, 40, 45, 90 degrees. This is called the azimuth. It's the angle from north where the sun is. Well, it also tilts, and you can see a protractor. There's a little line right there. You can measure what's called the elevation. With those two, with the azimuth and the elevation, you can know where the sun is. Uh, I had a pinhole here, which is projecting onto, this, onto a, a plus shape right there, but I call this a Sarfati modification, because good Jonathan over there, he realized that with this length, this is about one third of a meter, so a three diopter reading glasses from the dollar store actually projects a, a focused image of the sun right there, so now we can also measure the relative size of the sun throughout the day. And I uh, added a polarized pair of sunglasses so no one welded their retinas with the, uh, the, the, uh, the yeah, you, you got the point. So with this machine, I can measure the azimuth and elevation. 
you can see that at noon, these two models are very similar to one another. Why? Because this experiment, because Eratosthenes was about our latitude. But when I measured it, even though they were very similar to one another, my measured points followed the global Earth, not the flat Earth. Now, give me any flat Earth model. I'll change the parameters in my thing. I don't care how big the Earth is. I don't care how high the sun is. We can test it. And that thing just happens to be accurate enough to do it. And I'm, I'm, I can't believe it. I'm shocked. Anyway, this will be out on Thursday. Um, we'll have some pieces of paper where you can go anytime you want. Take these two measurements, measure in this millimeter scale what the size of the Earth is, write on a piece of paper, drop it in the box, and we'll see how close we can get as a group. Okay? Oh, by the way, uh, the size of the sun should also change size over time. In the flat Earth model, the sun gets closer and farther away, right? Well, in ours, no, it's always 93,000 miles, 93 million miles away. It doesn't change size throughout the day. Careful. There are memes out there. Here's two examples. Oh, the sun does get smaller as it gets towards the horizon because it's getting closer to the vanishing points, getting farther away from us. Really? Look at that, that upper picture. Where's the sun in there? I don't know. It's overexposed. Look at the lower picture. That's nonsense. If you are a flat earth supporter, I'm putting you on notice. If you post anything like this online, you are lying. Okay? Why? Because I can take lousy pictures like that too. This is Monday morning, out, out, right out uh, my, my hotel room here. But I was also here on Sunday morning. And we had, I can't believe it, and I can't believe my cell phone can do this. Now, I had to get up at 5.45 in the morning to do this, but... First question, how come before sunrise those clouds are lit up? Oh, yeah, because here it is actually curved. No. Second, there's a horizon. There's no horizon in flat earth concept. The horizon is the place where the shape of the earth actually interferes with your view. Notice, if the sun is, is, is getting smaller because of, of perspective, how come the bottom half of the sun has so much perspective you can't see it and the top half is right there? Also notice the sun hasn't changed size, nor will it all day long. In fact, it's easier to do it with the moon. The sun is harder because digital cameras get overexposed. Man, I can't believe this. Awesome. This is a direct refutation of the flat earth idea. Uh, you'll see a lot of flat earth supporters saying the horizon is flat, the horizon is flat, the horizon is flat. See that earth isn't curved. Well, of course the horizon is flat. Duh. You know why the horizon is flat? Because the horizon is a tangential slice of a sphere. Stand anywhere on earth where you can see the horizon, point at the horizon, turn in a circle. Oh, it's flat. It doesn't matter what altitude. A, a guy up in outer space, right? He's on internal spaceships and floating in the air. You can go like this and go. It will be flat, always. Now, does it curve? Yes, it does. Um, Dave, how high did you say you flew? All right. Air Force pilot, 50,000 feet. That's, that's twice as high as a commercial airliner thereabouts. That's way high. He said he could see the curve. But it doesn't curve as much as you think because they, they put it into our mind. It should curve, right? It's round. Uh-uh. Oh, so when you look at that perspective, it separates from the horizontal line much less than you actually think because they put this false idea into our head. All right, there's no horizon in the flat earth. Obviously, this is not flat. The Bible talks about sunrise and sunset. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. That word is the same word they would use for like get up out of bed. It's to rise up. It doesn't rise in a flat earth. It had to come around. It only rises really when it gets overhead. No, we have this thing called the ecliptic. This is the path that the sun follows. This thing can measure that. In fact, oh man, two nights ago, it was amazing. Right at sunset, Mercury, the moon, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that all my life. I was always looking at stars. I don't think I've ever seen that. It, and all of those things follow the ecliptic. That is, a circle, slightly tilted, because the Earth is actually tilted. Okay. Here's one more uh, easy flat Earth model disproof. 
I should use model again. I shouldn't use that word model. That is, anytime you look at the sun or the moon, no matter where you are, no matter what angle you're looking at it, it's always a circle. It can't be a spotlight, because a spotlight would be oval when it's over here and then round when it's overhead. Any slice you take through it is always circular, which means it is a sphere. Unless the universe is a mirage. But that's Eastern mysticism, not Christianity. And by the way, one of the big promoters of the flat earth idea is a yoga instructor, martial arts instructor living in Thailand. He's American, but he's full of Eastern mysticism. Another big flat earther is an anti-Christian. If he says, if you believe the Trinity, you're a heretic. These two people are the people that started the whole, I'm not really started, but they, they're the biggest popularizer of the flat earth idea on YouTube. Today, people are, oh, no, I'm not one. I don't believe that. I don't know. No, you owe what you're saying to these people. And by the way, I, I took my kids down to the local library. I had my son put his finger on Johannesburg, and I took a string and stretched it to all these different cities. And then I calculated the great circle route from all these cities, and I compared them. And when you compare the flat earth distance to the great circle route, Guess which one actually, oh yeah, okay. That's on creation.com, direct test of the flat earth model, right there. Okay, what we're seeing is an existential crisis in philosophy. A tremendous failure of critical thinking, an incredible application of subjective reasoning, arbitrary hunting and picking for things that seem to support the theory, which don't. And it seems to be that in order to believe flat earth, you had to be preconditioned with a different conspiracy theory. Men didn't walk on the moon, 9-11, one of the other, that's like testing grounds, and this is just something that comes up. And you have to reject biblical principles. We simply cannot reject 2,000 years of Christian scholarship. We cannot blithely read the Bible in English and assume we understand the subtle nuances of the underlying languages. This flat earth idea hits on multiple important topics, including exegesis, logical analysis, biblical perspicuity, biblical inspiration, textual preservation. Are those important issues? And they might not be salvation issues, but they're really important stopping points along the way, aren't they? Really, we're dealing with the difference between operational and historical science. I have no problem with the way things work. Observing, testing, repeating things today. This is the foundation of modern science called operational science. No, evolution is historical science. So some, like this, let me give you an example. This man built a steam-powered rocket. The dude built a steam-powered rocket and launched himself. Wow, that's some smarts, right? But he says, I don't believe in science, says Hughes, whose main sponsor for the rocket is Research Flat Earth. I know about aerodynamics and fluid dynamics and how things move through the air, about the certain size of rocket nozzles and thrusts, but that's not science. That's just a formula. There's no difference between science and science fiction. Oh. What has he done? He's blended historical and operational science, and he says that since evolution claims to be science, science is wrong. That's not true. Everything he listed here is operational science. Science works, and it works well. For you fans of King James, the King James Bible that is, there's a picture of King James. What's he holding in his hand? The Globus Cruciger, a symbol of Christ's authority over the earth, which is the globe. There's no time in the Christian era where people thought the earth was flat. The problem with geocentrism, the main one, is that it is a descriptive model. It's kinematic. You know that word, kinematic. You've been to the movies. You've been to the cinema. Same word, the moving picture show. A kinematic model is just descriptive. The problem with this, the, the Tychonian view that you know, the sun goes around the earth, but Venus and Mercury go around the sun, everything else around. The problem with this is it's just descriptive. And these orbits are circular. We now know the orbits are not circular. They're actually ellipses, and one of the foci of the ellipse is on the sun. Weird. Oh, yeah. We don't have any pictures of the earth, like this picture of the earth taken from behind Saturn. No, okay. Here's the big, the, my big deal problem with geocentrism, the, or the idea that the Earth is the middle. This is the distance from the Earth of all the planets. We measure this with high school algebra and trigonometry. That red line 
If these things have to go around the Earth and get back to where they were started in 24 hours, that red line, anything above it, the object has to move faster than the speed of light to get back to its starting point in 24 hours. We know what happens when we accelerate things. Hence, uh, you know, atom smashers. The reason that the thing at CERN is so big is because when you accelerate a particle to relativistic speeds, it becomes very massive. You can't bend its trajectory with it, even a giant magnet. So you've got to make a big ring. If Neptune weighs as much as a hydrogen atom, it would take more energy than the energy in the universe to make it go in a circle in that much time. In fact, there is no known substance that could possibly hold Neptune. There's no crystal sphere. It's not possible. Covalent bonds will break. In fact, the, the forces required would, would separate protons in a nucleus because a strong force wouldn't be hard, uh, strong enough to hold them. It would rip apart protons into quarks. It would probably disintegrate quarks. There's nothing in physics saying this is even remotely possible. So what holds it together? Let me mix some metaphors here. Perhaps transparent adamantium. Sorry. The modern idea is geokinetic. I think this should be pankinetic. Everything moves, but geokinetic. Everything is free to move, and the solar system follows Newton's laws of gravity and motion with Einstein's modifications. What is this a picture of? If you took a picture of the sun exactly one year apart every year, the sun wouldn't always be in the same place. In fact, the sun wobbles more. The sun is about that wide. It wobbles more than its own radius. Why? Because it depends upon where Jupiter and Saturn are. Yeah, because gravitation, they pull the sun. The sun wobbles as those things orbit it. Why does the position of the sun in the sky have anything to do with the position of Saturn and Jupiter? Oh yeah, gravity. Flat Earth has no concept of this. Geocentrism has no way to explain this, and yet this is operational science. I'm going to claim that Newton's three laws of motion and Einstein's modifications give us the best predictive engine in history. A simple idea. All things are attracted to all other things. And a simple formula that the force of gravity depends upon the two masses divided by how far apart they are. There's a couple squares in there, but so what? It's easy math, right? So check this out. There's the sun in the bottom left corner. We've known about Jupiter for a long time. We've known about Saturn for a long time. Now, as these astronomers are plotting the positions of these planets, they said, wait a minute. They don't, they're not in the right place. According to gr uh, gravity theory, they should actually, but no, there's something wrong. And they use that to discover Uranus. They use the gravitational anomalies of two seen planets to discover an, un an invisible planet. And when U Uranus had gone less than three quarters of the way around, they said, after we account for Saturn and Jupiter, Uranus has got a wow. Oh, so a scientist wrote the Berlin Observatory. They said, hey, point your telescope right there. And Neptune was discovered that very night. James Bradley strapped a telescope to his chimney. <laughs> and every night for 20 years, he looked through his telescope and he could wiggle the eyepiece a little bit. He only he measured two stars, one on each side of the North Pole, the North Star. And they'd pass over his house every night. And for 20 years, he measured them and he realized he had to wiggle his eyepiece. Why? Because we're moving. In fact, he calculated the speed of light. What's the speed of light? Three times 10 to the eighth, right? Meters, oh, 2.95. 1729. Here's the sun. Here's the earth. Six months later, there's the earth. If you take the angle to a star six months apart with a radius of 93 million miles, whatever it is in kilometers, that star should move. If you're moving, that star should move, right? Right? unless it's really far away, or unless the Earth doesn't move. Well, if those stars wiggle, then we should do it. Then the Earth should be moving. Friedrich Bessel in 1838 made the first stellar parallax uh, measurement of a star called 61 Cygni. He said it was 10 light years away. It moved 0 0.00009 degrees. It's really far away. But here's a map of multiple stars and where they are in the heavens, how far away they are. And we know that because of geometry. But they're moving with respect to themselves, meaning there's no crystal sphere in which they're embedded. By the way, the European Space Agency has launched a, a, a satellite that's going to measure tens or hundreds of thousands of parallax measurements of, of nearby stars. 
We know how far away they are, and they move in a predictable manner. Absolute geocentrism cannot explain this in any practical way, and flat Earth is not even close. There are comets that go beyond Neptune and come close to Earth. If, the, if these things orbit, if the whole universe is going around the Earth, that comet has to get beyond light speed and come sub-light speed to get close to Earth. It would need a warp drive. But in the end, so what? The flat Earth concept, even geocentrism, do nothing. The Earth system could still be millions of years old. It could still allow time for evolution. It does not preclude other worlds. I mean, the concept of a flat Earth with a dome, with God sitting on His throne, the Earth is His footstool. Maybe his name is Elohim. Maybe he goes, hey, God Joshua next door. Hey, look at my world. I'm, I'm covered 70% in water. Oh, yeah, well, I got deserts in my world. And Joe over here says, oh, no, I've got a whole bunch of purple people in my world. <laughs> Why not? The earth is a tiny little place in the flat earth model. A little petty God. Almost like a Mormon God. A Mormon God who is not in control of the universe, who's trapped in the universe who's only the, the god of a little planet. But you might become a god with your own planet later, your own little petty god. No, our god created this universe. He's outside the universe. The universe exists because of him. He is all-powerful and all-sufficient, and he didn't create this tiny little 25,000-mile diameter dome. That is not a biblical thought. By the way, I skipped over the 200 verses that supposedly prove the flat earth. Go to our Flat Earth article. Jonathan actually read through all of them, and then we categorize them into which logical fallacy they're applying. <laughs> Most of them have nothing to do with Flat Earth. Some of them actually have nothing to do with anything, and some of them are just lying. You check it out yourself. I'll leave you with that. Now, how does one become a Flat Earther? One, cult-like brainwashing. You watch the Flat Earth videos, and you know, the guys... It just, they just talk like there's something just, just bursting out of them. And it's, it's powerful. And, and they'll talk for 30 minutes before they say anything. I'm not kidding you. 30 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour maybe before they say anything, you can actually, actually get your brain around and test. But by that point, your brain is mush because no one can think that long. And almost all Flat Earth videos are like three hours long. You get into this, you're going to go down the rabbit hole. I do not recommend it. Now, I'm not talking from on high, but I don't recommend you actually tangle with these people because everything they say will take you hours to answer. And down, down, down you go. There's too much lying misinformation. If you're tangling with a flat earther or someone like that, um, understand they think they're special. They think God has revealed something to them that you don't have. And incautious exploration has trapped many people. Teenagers, young people, people without any formal scientific training, not that formal scientific training means anything, but we do learn how to think. If you know someone in this position, love them. Don't necessarily engage them, that will just antagonize them. Love them, support them, give them some thought bombs every once in a while, Show them that you are stable and rational. I have not yet seen someone come out of this because it is, in fact, a cult. Now, there's no primary leader, and they're not stealing everybody's money, and there's not necessarily any sexual deviancy. Put those parts of normal cults, normal, cults aside, <laughs> and they have the same strategy as misinformation. You, you have to spend so much time learning this stuff, you kind of forget the rest of the world. Check out Spacecraft Earth pioneer in the space industry. Fantastic book. Check out Spike's three DVDs. Look at Alien Intrusion. Look at Starlight Time and the New <laughs> Physics. Check out Light Years No Problem. Check out the Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky. I read this at a homeschool conference. This is my kind of astronomy. Cool stuff. And uh, you might look at our amazing created solar system. Thank you.